The story of the seven, the Chicago seven, is a story of protest and confrontation from long ago that's about to be retold in a new movie. Tracy Smith takes us back. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. In 2020, no as the season of social unrest no has become the autumn of discontent, it's remarkable how it looks like another time, 52 summers ago. In 1968, there was revolution in the air. One young rebel climbed up to lower the American flag to half-mast. The nation was in turmoil over civil rights, split over the Vietnam War. A handful of police clubbed a protest leader. And in late August, outside the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, around 10,000 protesters squared off with about 23,000 police and National Guard troops. And all hell broke loose. In less than a minute, what had been a relatively quiet crowd was a raging mob. Seven months later, the government charged the suspected ringleaders with, among other things, conspiracy and crossing state lines to incite a riot. At first, there were eight Chicago defendants, Jerry Rubin, Abby Hoffman, Tom Hayden, Rennie Davis, Bobby Seale, Lee Weiner, John Freunds, and David Dellinger. The law doesn't recognize political no, trials. No, no, we weren't arrested. We were chosen. Their trial is now the subject of a new Netflix film, The Trial of the Chicago Seven. Let's rehearse. Written and directed by Aaron Sorkin. We're giving them exactly what they want, a stage and an audience. Yeah, you really think there's going to be a big audience? The movie's been in the works for 14 years, but Sorkin says it took on a new urgency after President Donald Trump took office. Was there a, a moment in Donald Trump's ascendancy when you said, OK, now I need to tell this story? Well, it began when he was running for president. And at his rallies, when a protester would shout out something, he'd become nostalgic. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. About the old days when they'd beat the crap out of him and punch him in the face. Do you know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. In the old days he was talking about the 68. The police advanced into the crowd, clubbing those who resisted. One of those protesters, Chicago 7 defendant Rennie Davis, needed a stretcher after taking a billy club to the head. I was being clubbed by police, and police were literally screaming, kill Davis. Oh, my goodness. And how bad was your head injury? I had to go to the hospital, and so I'll tell the story now that I've never shared before publicly, you know. Yeah, I went to the hospital to get uh, 13 stitches, and the police realized that I was in the hospital because they knew I had been clubbed, and so they started a search of the hospital room by room by room, and mostly the nurses, they could end their career by what they did. I mean, they put me on a trolley cart and covered me with a sheet and moved me from room to room. To hide you from the police. To hide from the police, yeah. For protesters and the police who were ordered to stop them, it was a dangerous game. But the activists all knew what they were in for, says former defendant Lee Weiner. Did you know going in that you were risking prison time? That was always, of course, not only a possibility, but a probability. You know, what are we going to not do it just because of that? Not a chance. We've heard testimony that your plans for the convention were designed specifically to draw the police into a confrontation. Well, if I'd known it was going to be the first wish of mine that came true, I would have aimed a lot higher. It's Actor yes, no Sasha question. Baron Cohen yeah. studied yeah. Abby Hoffman no long really before he played him. Everything pointed to one man. Who is this guy? Is he a fool or is he actually the smartest guy in the room? What do you think? I think he was the smartest guy in the room. He developed this whole style of protesting that was designed to elicit as much media attention as possible. And even during the riots in Chicago, Abby always had his mind on where the cameras were. We can't fight it in the court because this is the cat. And these are the people that are putting us on trial, see? In fact, Hoffman and his co-defendant, Jerry Rubin, became celebrities in their own right, as observed by our own Bob Schieffer. It was raining, it was cold, in short, it was not a fit night out for man and beast. So it was only natural that those masters of media manipulation, Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, should choose this night to hold a news conference. The only people that can stop this trial are the people in the streets. The U.S. attorney wanted a Negro defendant to scare the jury. I was thrown in to make the group look scarier. 
But the trial was a very different experience for the lone black defendant, Bobby Seale. Seale wound up representing himself, and he clashed with Judge Julius Hoffman. Bobby Seale was gagged and chained today for refusing to obey the judge. Handcuffs were clamped onto both wrists, leg iron shackled both boots, and a white linen cloth reinforced with adhesive tape was knotted behind his neck. It was breathtaking. He would try to pull his hands up, and then he would just be clubbed in front of the jury. And this went on for several days. I wasn't in any, in any contempt, but Judge Hoffman, I told him, I said, you in contempt of the American people. Eventually, Bobby Seale's case was declared a mistrial, and the Chicago 8 became the Chicago 7. Five were convicted of some charges, but all were overturned on appeal. Their trial is history, but it seems their fight is still very much alive. We didn't need it to get more relevant, but it did. The park is closed. In Kenosha and Kentucky and Washington, when you see, once again, peaceful protesters being met with tear gas, nightsticks. You, know, you gotta care a lot about this country to go out in the street and face that kind of danger. You gotta care a lot about America. Anti-war demonstrators gathered in Grant Park. This then, as now, the demonstrators risked their safety and their freedom to make themselves heard. Surrounded by grim, silent soldiers, the demonstrators decided to sing. And, according to former Chicago 7 defendant Lee Weiner, it was all worth it. It was crazy, for sure. It was hard, it was brutal, it was dangerous. It was an effort by the government to belittle our efforts and our beliefs that America would be better. And so we had to fight back. And in that fighting back, we did not a bad job.